a son, I am loved by Jesus. If you're visiting us for the first time, really, again, from us, from the team, an incredibly warm welcome. It is so good to have you with us. If you find yourself in this place, can I tell you, you're in an incredibly good place. These people, we get to boast a little bit, are amazing. I almost know none of them because I do not come to this congregation, but they are amazing people, believe me. And um, I want to encourage you to get knitted into this community and get involved because it will change your life and watch what God does. It's super exciting to be back here. Like um, Mike was saying, I've been part of the Militant Plan for the last three years, but we've been part of Life Changing since roughly the end of 2001. So we are part of the furniture. We've been here a long time, but it really is incredible to be back here and sharing this evening with you. We are in our Jesus is King series, and we are hoping that this series is going to shape and fashion you to once again see Jesus as king up front and center, to change your life because you need to see Jesus as king. If you do not see him as king, it's a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. And maybe that's a little bit different for you and you're in a different space and you're on a journey, but I wanted to tell you, Jesus is king. He's on his throne and we need to get him up front and center and it'll change our lives. Let's read. If you've got your Bibles with you, Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. I'm very thankful for my size 16 font on my page. I do have my Bible. It is a large print Bible, but I need glasses. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she found out she was pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she had given birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. And I wanted to, this this, this morning, this evening, if you're looking for a title of this Jesus is King part, it's Allow God to Speak. And I wanted to ask you, in your life, in your business, in your marriage, in your finances, your parenting, in your dreams, what happens when they don't go according to plan? What do you do? I want to let you know you need a plan. You actually need a plan. And you need to implement your plan. And a lot of that plan looks like following Jesus. If your plan doesn't include Jesus, you need a new plan. You're going in the wrong direction. Joseph had a plan. He had proposed He was planning a wedding. He was working out the details. He had set up his future with his bride. He had this dream of what it was going to look like. He was going to say, I do have some kids and live a happy life. Surprisingly, it didn't go according to plan. Is there anyone in this room that surprisingly your plan has not gone to plan? Anybody? You guys, you've got to give me something. Please, I need help. eh? Please, please. Thank you. It's good. It's good. Life doesn't go to plan. Joseph's default response, I believe, is a lot of what we would do. When stuff doesn't go to plan, what do we do? You start to hustle. You start to scramble. You've got plan A. When plan A doesn't work, you've got plan B. When plan B doesn't work, you've got plan C. When plan C doesn't work, you've got plan D. By the end of it, you've woven such a mess, you actually don't know where you are. And you're so far in the hole, and it's so dark, you're feeling quite hopeless. And that is a default that we have. 
And that is why you need a plan and you need direction and you need to be following Jesus because the word tells us he is the light of the world. He will light your way. And if you're not following him, you're going to end up in quite a dark, lonely place, which a lot of us have found ourselves in. But because of his grace, he allows us to find our way out. I want to suggest this evening a strategy for when life starts to go wrong, when it's unplanned, when it doesn't go to plan. And the first one is allow God to speak. Will you allow God to speak in your life? Verse 20 in that um, chapter says, As he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. As he considered leaving Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And the angel of the Lord spoke to him very, very clearly. We, as sons and daughters of the Most High, when you've given your life to Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us. He comes and He lives on the inside of us. And, and the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and He leads us. And this is incredibly important. It's a fundamental key to our everyday living, to understand that we have the Spirit of God alive in us, directing us. And we need to access that. The challenge is when we don't do that, I believe we end up with a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of disillusionment, and it literally feels like you're dragging yourself over broken glass and stones. And then you're wondering why. <laughs> why is it so hard? Why is it so tough? When we haven't allowed God to speak into our situation, allowed Him to direct us, allowed Him to give us strength, give us courage to lift us up and direct us. One of the key ways that you allow God to speak is by reading the Word of God. And you'll hear us beat this drum time and time and time again. I live a very simple faith. I'm not the deepest theologian you'll ever meet in your life. I read it. I try to live it. That's my, that's my philosophy. When God changes it, He'll change it. But it's good enough for me. If I read it, I want to do it. The challenge is if you are not daily in the Word of God, Maybe I'm reaching. If you are not in the Word of God twice a week, you have a problem because you are not actually getting any direction. You are not seeing what the Word of God is saying about you as a son and a daughter. You are not allowing God to speak. And then we start making decisions out of the wrong place. And we end up in the wrong place because we are not allowing God to speak. You've got to be in the Word of God. You've got to take it very seriously. It's a process. It takes discipline. You don't have to read volumes and volumes of chapters. Just pick one chapter, half a chapter, but get into the Word of God and allow it to shape you. When you don't, it's like you're paddling upstream with a stick. <laughs> have you ever tried to paddle with a stick? I said this this morning, it sucks. Are you allowed to say that from up here? It really sucks. Yet we do it all the time and wonder why we don't get anywhere. So I wanted to encourage you, allow God to speak. Get an oar in your hand and you can get to paddle in the direction He wants you to go. When you read, of the, when you read the Word of God, truth rises and it's like a weapon. And you get to take that weapon and draw it and cut the enemy at his knees. But it's difficult for truth to arise when you are not reading it, allowing God to speak. So you never draw your weapon and you allow yourself to get absolutely battered by what's out there. Read the Word of God. Allow that weapon to rise, the truth of God to rise. Allow the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of truth to direct you and cut the enemy at his knees. Amen? Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, 6. I'll read that again. Be strong and courageous. Who doesn't need that? Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord goes with you. You are not alone. 
And he will never leave you nor forsake you. This truth is a weapon. Allow God to speak. What is he saying to you today? It brings us to our first point of faith and not fear. I believe as people, we operate out of two places. If you are really honest with yourself, you operate out of two places. Either fear or faith. Those are the two. And I think you need to allow God to speak to you and shape you in those areas. Because when you respond out of fear, you end up with knee-jerk reactions that, again, lead you in a different direction to where God is taking you. Because we want to take the easy road. We want to take the path that's easy. But God leads, needs us to take the narrow path, which actually gets us through it quicker. The challenge with fear is that when you start taking off-ramps that go on to... Have any of you been in, driven in Joburg? It's horrendous. You take an off-ramp that's on an off-ramp that's on an off-ramp, and the next thing, your GPS is recalculating, and you know that Joburg is behind you, and you're driving in the wrong way. It says, do a U-turn in 56 Ks. Not great. The challenge is when we make decisions out of fear, and we haven't allowed the Word of God to speak and shape us, that's literally what we do. And two or three or four or five years later, you find yourself back at the same off-ramp. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life like that. I can't afford to live my life like that. Not when I have Jesus, who died and rose for me to lead me, to guide me. We've got to be better because he has made us perfect. We've got to live like that. What's interesting is that every time an angel appears in the Bible to someone, they say, fear not, do not fear, do not be afraid, every time. God is with you. Do not fear, do not be afraid. One of our greatest challenges is when God speaks it, we have to choose it. Fear is our default. Faith is our choice. You've got to choose. And that's a process. I get it wrong a lot. But the beauty of the gospel tells me that every day is a new day in Christ Jesus. So every day I get to wake up and say, God, it's a new day. Forgive me for yesterday. Help me to live your word today. But you don't know that unless you're reading the word of God. And so you end up building on wobbly foundations until it completely falls apart. How do you tell God's voice from the enemy's voice? It's quite easy. The enemy will always bring fear and condemnation. Jesus says there's no fear and condemnation in Christ Jesus. That's what the Word tells us. Again, it's easy to know when the enemy's speaking. Fear and condemnation. It's not from God. You need to make better decisions. It's interesting, seven years ago, um, we run our own business. This is my beautiful wife here and my beautiful daughter, oldest daughter over there, Britt. They're hearing this for the second time today. Thanks for enduring me. The, um, seven years ago, our business ran into a little bit of trouble. It was a, was a difficult time, and, and we had to let people go because we couldn't pay them. It was really hard. It was really hard. And I actually realized about three or four months ago, God started to do something in me as he started calling me to more. And I realized that I've been operating in the last seven years out of fear. Every year we've grown. We grow year on year. God adds to us. It's incredible. God has been faithful, but I've actually been operating out of fear. And for the next season that God is calling us to in our business, we've, I've realized that I've had fear. And my faith journey looks like this. God gave me a number, a minimum number, for every single one of our employees that they have to earn. And I want to be clear, I don't have that money. <laughs> but it's interesting because God spoke to me, and he spoke to me just through, it was just a sense of actually realizing, does anyone know what I'm talking about? I don't want to sound weird. But I just realized, just like God started to speak to me, and that's crazy. God came to Joseph and said, your wife is pregnant from the Holy Spirit. That had never happened. <laughs> there was no documentation or even tweet or Instagram post, or Facebook post about that. Do you know how weird that must have been? 
So God started to speak. And um, he challenged me around those numbers. And then he challenged me about the space we're in. So I started looking for new premises. And the premises, God said that I looked at one premises. It's easier because it's cheaper. And then God said, no, that premises. It's 4.369 times bigger than what we currently have. I'm like, wow, God. So I did the numbers. I need an extra 100K net a month for that before we make another cent. I was like, okay, God. So I started the process. And I started engaging some of our staff around their salaries for next year. I said, hey, I don't know how we're going to do this. just want to let you know. God said, that's what you're going to earn next year. We're moving premises, started state agents, doing some paperwork. December, for the last 10 years, has been horrendous. I think our best month we ever had was about 100K, which is not enough in case you run a business and you have staff and vehicles. <laughs> it's not enough. This year, we're sitting this December. We just over, we've invoiced just over 500,000 rand. Four times more. Four times more. When God starts to show you some scary stuff, you've got to trust Him. He is with you. He'll neither leave you nor forsake you. He'll give you courage. He'll give you strength. When we don't obey, it's a challenge. We get authority, but I'll get there. The second bit is, uh, or point, is partnership and not spectatorship. In verse 21, it says, you are to name him. God called Joseph to be part of the process that Joseph, uh, that Joseph would actually name his son, Jesus. He didn't call him to be a passive father and onlooker. He called him to be involved in the story. God has called you to be part of a story. It takes courage to step into what God's calling you to in this time, in this place. Can I tell you that God is always calling you to something more? Always. Because if He wasn't, you wouldn't need faith. You could actually just exist and carry on and do whatever you wanted. But God is always calling you to more. Why do you think we have phrases like save people, serve people, so that serve people become saved people? Because it's about belonging. It's about being, being a part of. Can I encourage you? Get involved in community. It's good for you. The show of quick hands, how many people in this place have been affected in a positive light from this community? It's incredible. You need friends. You need people who will tell you the truth, even when it hurts. There's a good community to be in. Not perfect people but sons and daughters saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, each of us on our own journey, pulling in the same direction. It's the most incredible thing you'll ever do. It's the most incredible thing you'll ever do. It's hard, but it's worth it. Can I tell you that you are not a victim of your circumstances? You have to choose Jesus. You've got to choose his ways. Choose what he says about you. You cannot be a victim. This world and everything you see in the news and the media, victims. People don't want to take responsibility for their actions. If you've made mistakes, take responsibility. I come from a background, I come from a divorced home. I was sexually abused by years by my cousin. I've been addicted to cocaine and ecstasy. I've had an almost drinking problem. I've stolen money. I've been dishonest but I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I'm not a victim of my circumstance. I get to stand here today, restored, healed, preaching the word of God because of his goodness. And I want to give him the honor and the thanks and the glory for that. It's not anything clever that I've done. All I've done is read what the word of God says, get involved in community, and watch what God does. I want to tell you that authority comes with obedience. 
You want authority? Can I tell you that every single person in this room has a measure of authority? You have to take hold of it and act on it. Don't get bullied. You serve the King of Kings. That makes you an heir to a kingdom. You have authority. Stand on your authority. Make decisions from your authority. Stand with people with your authority. Don't get bullied. Christ is for you. Christ is for you. I'm not talking about an arrogance. I'm just saying a knowing of who you are in Christ. Just one more thing on partnership. Jesus had 12 disciples. It was in team. Every time guys did ministry trips, every time guys traveled, they traveled in twos and threes and fours and sixes. And you've got to do your life in team. If you're a lone wolf, don't believe the lie. No, no, it's not for me. It's not what God created. The Bible tells you you were created for His pleasure. You were created for intimacy with Him. You were created to worship. You were created to be in community together, pulling in one direction. You weren't created to be by yourself. Don't believe the lie. Thirdly, his promises, not your ideas. In verse 22, it says, all of these occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to the prophet. The problem with God's promises is we like to apply filters, sepia, vivid, Valencia, let's roll with it. Six pack, <laughs> plastic. Why are we so intent on filtering God's promises for our lives? I want to use an analogy of a credit card, like an, a, a, a limitless black, gold, diamond, ruby, encrusted, whatever you want to call a credit card. When you give your life to Jesus, you get a credit card, metaphorically, that gives you access and power to the kingdom of God. So we take it and put it in our back pocket. And when the promises of God come along, we filter them, we ignore them, we're not obedient, so we lose our authority in those areas then our life gets messy. And you've got this credit card in your back pocket that you could just swipe and step into the things of God, yet we struggle to do that. Why? You're a son of the Most High, a daughter of the Most High. Read the Word of God, read what the promises are, and declare them over your life, and keep declaring them. Keep declaring them. God gave me another word around white noise. You've got to silence the white noise. You've got to silence the white noise around you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. No matter what's happening around you, keep declaring the Word of God. Keep declaring His promises. Stop coming up with good ideas. Good ideas are fine. They'll get you so far. But they're not God. And so you take another off-ramp with a good idea and find yourself 10 years down the line, how did I get here? That's the problem. It takes 10 years for you to look up again. And you've lost a decade of your life. But I'm going to tell you what's incredible about the things of God. He can restore it like that. Once you acknowledge, repent, God restores it like that. Can I tell you that God never goes against His Word? He cannot lie. So you need to know what He's saying about your situation and about your life right now. God cannot lie. And you declare that thing until it shifts. Watch what God will do. It's only seven pages here, guys. We're on page six. It's fine. It's a big, big, big print. The last thing is wake up. Joseph woke up, and he did what God said. So many of us are sleepwalking. We are sleepwalking. God speaks. We don't do. And we fumble around in the dark. Wake up. It's not just for someone else to take hold of the things of God. It's for you. It's not somebody else's story. It's your story.
God is always showing us the potential of what He wants for us, yet we struggle to believe it. Know that you are loved, that you are worthy, that you are acceptable. Be honest, take stock, make the big calls. Watch what God does. Watch what God does. When it makes no sense, but you know God has spoken. All I can say is, I'm thankful that I'm getting it right more than I'm getting it wrong. And I don't mean that to be arrogant. I'm normally the guy that has to hit my head on a ledge till I've got blood in my eyes. And I'm like, oh, there's a ledge. 100%. Thanks, VP. We all want a fresh word from God. What was the last thing God said to you? Always looking for a fresh word when you haven't done the last thing he asked you to do. It's in the detail. It's in the small things. When you don't obey the small things, how are you ever going to act on the big thing? How are you ever going to step into your destiny? How are you ever going to step into where God needs you to be at that time, at that place, for that person? He ends up using somebody else who does. The simplicity of the Christian, of Christmas and, and Christianity is that God speaks and God saves. It's our job to listen and obey. We need to get ourselves and posture ourselves to allow God to speak. When we don't do that, you end up patching holes. God gave me a picture of a ship with water springing in. And then you only have so many appendages before, if you like it, no one's taking a photo, good. <laughs> you only have so many fingers and so many toes as that thing just continues to spring. And it feels like you're sinking. Wake up. Trust God. Declare the things of God. Live out of faith and not fear. Partner. Choose God's promises for your life and watch what he does. Can I ask you to stand with me? I think it's amazing when, um, when we get preachers, we get people. Preachers are people. They're people who live lives and navigate. This man's life is Monday, very early, sometimes to very late, sometimes all week, driving through the night to get systems around the world, uh, up, up to Joburg and to Durban. You're getting a man who works hard, who's seeing the favor of God come into a story, and you hear a testimony like a breakthrough in this month. I'm encouraged by that. You're not getting someone who spent all week preparing for this moment. No, he's just sharing his life with some revelation in the Word of God. I look at Joseph. He's just an ordinary guy. He's, he seems like an ordinary guy. He's got a, a good job. He's got a plan. He's going to get a girl. It's going to work out. And yet God breaks into that thing and messes it all up radically. And I'm going to ask Brett to pray for us tonight, just that the favor of God would come. Even like the story of the descender turnover, the faith. You know the amazing things? Joseph got a son where he didn't do anything in the story. He didn't sow sealed seed in that field to bear fruit. Let's use some analogies. There are children in the room. But he didn't. But he got to name a son. And, and I've, I've named three sons. It's been some of the greatest privileges of my life. I've named hundreds of people with nicknames, like literally hundreds. That was seemed to be my calling in life as a kid. But, but when it came to my boys, the privilege of calling them their names was massive. Joseph, an ordinary guy who decided to trust God, got to name the king of kings in this life. Why? It's called grace. It's called the gospel. It's called God's gracious hand upon his people. And we get to receive it. This is not a name it and claim it. This is not a prosperity gospel. But actually, we are called to be a people who prosper. We are God's people. And because we are God's people, we prosper. And I'm going to ask Brett, not as a preacher now, but as a business leader who employs people, who deals 
in this world and of trade and economics and these, I'm going to ask for him as that guy to pray for us tonight so that you would prosper in the marketplace, that in your marketplace, because you are there, your businesses and your company would prosper because you're there, because God's gracious hand is always working. Is that all right? Will you receive from that guy tonight as we've so loved everything you've shared tonight? Thanks, Mark. Father, I thank you that you are so incredibly good. I thank you that you are faithful, that you are true, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you created every single one of us for greatness. Every single one of us. Father, I pray for the men and women in this room, your sons and daughters, help them to allow you to speak in those scary areas. and Give them the courage and the strength to make the decisions to declare the things of God over their marriages, over their kids, over their businesses, over their finances, the credit cards that need to be cut up, can they be cut up tonight? The finances that are in disarray, will they find someone in this community to share those finances with? I thank you for courage. I thank you for a change of direction. I thank you giving people an awe in their hand and not a stick. Tired of paddling with a stick. I thank you, Father, for that sword of truth. Father, I want to pray for a blessing for these sons and daughters. I thank you, Father, that you hold them close, that they would know that they are loved, that you will never leave them nor forsake them. I thank you, Father, that they have authority, authority because of you. And I thank you, Lord, you will start to open their eyes afresh, start to open their eyes afresh to the things of God, to their God story in their workplaces. I thank you for your incredible favor as we make the big decisions that make no sense to other people. I thank you that they don't have to make those decisions on their own. I thank you that your word says, seek counsel, but be led by the spirit of truth. We're tired of making cowboy decisions, Father. We want to make decisions under you because of the authority you've given us, declaring the word of God. I thank you that it creates, it shapes it brings life. It brings resurrection. It brings restoration. I thank you, Father, for this incredible privilege, this incredible privilege to be part of your story. From the beginning of time, when you spoke the earth into being, till you formed Adam from the dust, till you knitted us in our mother's wombs, and you breathed life into us. It's a beautiful story. And it's for every single one of you, every single one of us. And I thank you, Father, we would live from that place. I thank you, Father, your blood is enough that when we've got it wrong, the Bible says repent and you recalibrate, you reset, you restore. I thank you, Father, we get to build on that story. The blood of Jesus washes you clean as white as snow. Thank you, Father, that we choose to believe that and not what we know is on the inside of us. We want to declare the things of you over our lives.